as you pull open any drawer of the plan chest, I mean, it layers and years and years of history that is how those things have come about to be there. And it's an, it is an analog thing. I mean, they're all beautiful. Yeah, the majority are kind of silver gelatin prints. And there are some cibochromes upstairs and there's the odd cyanotype around it. Yes, there's quite a lot of different processes. And I couldn't believe my eyes that this was 99 Mount Street, which is where I had the gallery for 11 years. And so that it was, um, I absolutely had to purchase it. And so I'm very happy to have it home now. To have a cyanotype is a pretty rare thing. Um, and the area has changed dramatically because it is now fashion central. Um, and it used to be full of galleries. And so this reminds me of the good days of Mount Street. It will become more interesting the longer it's kept. And it is in the thing that is interesting about it is that it is kind of a cross-section of my life in photography from 1980 onwards. <laughs> it's funny. Doris Lessing has always been one of my all-time favourite authors, and so that it is, I really adore having that picture. It's a great, great photograph of her. She writes magnificent books that your life is better for having read them. So I like to have her in my house. I think photography somehow or other was um, born in my soul. I remember very little, always being interested in wedding albums, looking at all the old photographs. And even when I was like young at school, I started doing research projects and going and visiting painters and trying to find the photographs that were their influences and their background. And then I started actually making photographs myself while I was um, a student. We had this conversation about how he was a filmmaker and that he had made some photographs but very few. He had spent 30 years going out with his dog into the snow to take these pictures of trees and snow, just himself and his dog. He had not printed onto, photograph onto silver gelatin paper before so that we were sending out uh, big boxes of film to Tehran and then he was having a go at making prints. And So what he did um, after a while was he made a set of small prints to show me everything from which we then selected this exhibition. I had 30 pictures in my show and I just moved the gallery from Mayfair to Shoreditch so I had like the biggest space I'd ever had and he was the first person going to be in it. And, and thousands, I mean thousands of people came to see the show and it sold unbelievably well. But that is one that I actually bought at the time of the exhibition, that one there. And it's one of the very simplest of all. And because I heard Kiristami talk to, I think it was CNN came to interview him, and they were trying to engage him in a political discussion, which he would not get involved with. The closest that Abbas Kiristami came to saying was, not everything is black and white, and there is politics in everything. The work that I'm really enjoying living with is much quieter, calmer, more meditative, more contemplative work. And so I think that is what I like to live, because I told you I rehung everything with much more kind of dramatic pictures. And I took it down after about two weeks and put the old pictures back up, because I really like these. <laughs> that you might live in the centre of London, but what you want to have in your photographs is something that sums up memories and feelings. It's something that's quite emotional, quite emotive. All sorts of people that had never been to the gallery before came to see. It was all pictures of architecture in West Africa. Um, so all of them were mud buildings. And what I particularly liked about this picture, I love that little child with the wheelbarrow because it's just the everyday and the ordinary and the, it just also put the buildings in a kind of perspective. He is a historian first and foremost, and so that he has been motivated by investigating history when he's gone to photograph. And he's been to all of the areas, sort of dug deep like an archaeologist into the history of the landscape. He's not trying to do a political essay, because it's about people's lives and how they live their lives with architecture. I, I don't know, I think because I'd read a lot, because I wrote a dissertation about the value of photography as a fine art. Because in the 70s when I was doing my degree, it wasn't in this country. In America it had already kind of begun to flourish. But certainly in Europe, people did not consider photography um, 
to stand alone. It was a very poor relation to painting and sculpture. I have witnessed these great bastions of the fine art tradition, places like the Royal Academy in Piccadilly and Tate, you know, they all swore that they would never darken their walls with photography, and they have actually hosted really amazing photography exhibitions now. I mean, I just like it that the medium of photography is a vehicle that carries so much with it, and it's in the greatest, hugest conceptual sense to the most purely documentary He's always been one of those people that um, when you can kind of get lost in a sea of people telling you all sorts of different things or you read all sorts of, you just go back and you read things that David Goldblatt has said and you look at his photographs and it's all, he's just, he follows his own very good intuition and his good sense. He advertised in both black and white newspapers and magazines that he wanted to photograph people in their bedrooms black people and white people and this is someone who lives I think in a very modest hut and her husband had recently died which is why she has her um, head gear um, so low over her eyes because she's still in a period of mourning and I think this is the picture of great dignity and I have great admiration for that woman and I have great admiration for David Goldblatt as a photographer he's one of my top five photographers ever when I had a gallery that I couldn't, I mean, by then I already had a lot of photographs. By the time, while I worked at the photographer's gallery, I bought some things. I'm so happy that I did. There isn't a single photograph that I've ever bought that I've ever regretted or wanted to sell or wanted to exchange. I'm really, really glad. I mean, I'm very lucky that nearly every single print that I own is actually signed by the photographer and there's often a message. The real opening, opening up of people buying photographs in London um, in the 80s, it was a lot of people that made film or they worked in advertising, they worked in kind of creative industries anyway, and so that they understood photography a lot more. And it, I mean, during the 70s, Sue Davis had had the photographer's gown when great people had shown, like William Klein and Don McCullen and really interesting people. So people have begun to get sort of used to it and then I don't, know, I don't know why this sort of whole magical thing just happened. It really took off. It really, and people, I mean, I remember I did a little Lartigue show, and I think every single picture, every single Jacques-Henri Lartigue, I think he came, but every single picture sold. Well, people began to understand that, in fact, the print that you see in front of you, you'll probably never, ever see exactly that print again. You might see that image again, but it'll never be like that one that you're seeing. And so understanding the whole concept of how you even look and appreciate what a fine print is and what it means. Bravo, again, is someone that I met when I was in the photographer's gallery. Um, we became really good friends. I went to Mexico several times and stayed with him and his family. I mean, I'd probably known him for 20 years before I realised that what he always wanted to, his photographs to show was his essence of Mexico. Not his duty, but kind of his philosophy of life was to be able to show through the pictures that he made what Mexico, his Mexico was. Um, his titles are always very, very significant. And so you have to know this is the daughter of the dancer. I love the fact that she looks, I mean, people have written about this picture, but the circle of her hat and the circle of the window that she's looking from, and that you can't see her face, but you know that she's looking out into... Now, is it into the future? Is it into the dark? Is it into the past? What is, where is she looking? Every single photographer that has got a big body of work is thinking, what am I going to do with this and who wants it? And every national museum in this country is full up and does not have funds to take extra work in. So what do you do? The V&A can't possibly, they've just taken on all of the National Museum of Photography in Bradford's kind of, they can't take on forever and ever all of these archives. So what to do and where to go and where to place them? I mean, I have not got such a big collection, really. I've not got such a big collection. Um, and I do think probably my son will be able to take care of most of it. And I do think that the auction houses, some of them, like Bloomsbury, they do kind of turn things around and so things are beginning to find a secondary market. And so for some of the very famous artists, that's fine, but for some of the maybe you know, mid-range, auction houses aren't even interested in taking them on.
Well, it was 30. You know, Z15, so yes. Zelda Gallery for 15 years, 30 artists and 30 portfolios. Oh, okay. And this is what Perry chose to put into the portfolio, which I really like. It is just absolutely perfect graffiti. But it's very <laughs> Irish graffiti that if you, under, if, you, uh, if you look carefully, you'll see that there's a lot of, uh, here we have Sinead, um, there's a lot of, there's street names, there's place names. It's, it's very Irish graffiti. Because I grew up in Belfast, where there was terrorism, I grew up with it. I am not remote. It is something I grew up with that you must never let terrorists ever change your life in any way. You continue. And I think that culture is a huge communicator of thoughts and ideas and people bringing people together. And I think that that is one of the reasons I love working in the arts, that it transcends terrorism.